university, um, as well as um, sort of keeping on top of what's going on in the job market more generally. So hopefully I can give you a bit of information about the graduate job market and the trends that we're seeing. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Jack McDonald, if you can give, uh, give us a bit more information on uh, uh, maybe your research and what you're doing with the employability uh, at King's. Hi, uh, I'm Dr. Jack McDonald. Uh, I'm a lecturer in the War Studies Department. Um, as the careers and employability lead, my job is basically to try and, and talk to my colleagues and understand how we're embedding employability into the curriculum. But it's also a two-way role in that uh, I'm here. So if you want to talk about careers and employability, I'm one port of call. Obviously, Fiona and the Careers Service will have all the details about internships. Um, but essentially, if you want to talk about careers, that kind of thing, um, drop me a line. I have uh, office hours on Tuesdays. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, then, uh, Tom, if you want to introduce uh, yourself. Sure, yeah, of course, thanks. And thanks very much for, for hosting. Uh, my name's Tom Adams. Uh, my relationship to the War Studies Department is that I, I graduated uh, from a BA in War Studies in, in 2015 uh, and did a, a part-time master's degree uh, in terrorism in 2017. Uh, but I've been working in and around uh, sort of security and crisis industries for the last six years, um, mostly now uh, probably about four, four years of which has been doing crisis response in various guises. Uh, which started off doing kind of kidnap for ransom response, active assailant work um, and all of that kind of thing with the insurance community. Um, and then now uh, I'm a crisis communications consultant. So I, I handle the media for maritime companies uh, when, they've, when they've had some sort of crisis incident. Uh, I deal with their press pressure for them. Uh, so that's a, a brief kind of background for me. Very interesting. Thank you very much. Um, then, Olivia, if you want to give more uh, information uh, on yourself, please. Thanks. Hi, everyone. It's good to be here. Uh, I remember being in this position not so long ago and finding it quite tough to break into the defence and security sector. So hopefully this will be helpful. Uh, I work at a defence startup which provides sort of software to the UK and the US government. It's called Rebellion Defence. I come from a primarily sort of strategic communications background. I spent some time at the NATO Strategic Communicator Center of Excellence. And also I spent um, about a year and a half at a global strategic communications consultancy. And I've now sort of moved back into the tech sector full time. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and then uh, Robert, if you wanna introduce yourself, uh, the floor is yours. Sure, thank you. Uh, thanks for having me, uh, Robert Lindsay. Um, uh, I was graduated 2018, so I did a BA in War Studies and a one-year Master's in Intelligence and International Security. Uh, I now work as a Market and Competition Analyst at Thales UK. Uh, Thales Group, as they are known, are French multinational defence company, so the eventual provider of equipment to uh, Ministry of Defence here in the UK. We also work beyond defence in aerospace, transport, security, uh, cyber and space. Uh, so effectively, my job is to support the company in its uh, major prospects, intelligence and uh, strategic vision. All right. Thank you very much um, for all this, uh, those uh, information and those uh, introductions. Um, so um, as I said, we're going to divide the, the, the hour into discussion topic. But guys, if you have any question, uh, whatever, uh, for, in, to a particular uh, speaker, you can write down your question on the, on the chat because we, uh, there are 40 participants. So it's going to be too much to give you the opportunity uh, to speak at the same time. So maybe if you want to write down uh, the questions you have, and I'm going to gather all the, the, the questions and then ask, uh, ask them directly to to the speakers. So uh, the first uh, discussion topic that um, um, came into our mind with, uh, with Caroline, obviously, was, um, was uh, about how to choose a carrier and worst it is. So uh, if you're a, f a BA student, a master's student uh, doing international relations or worst it is, uh, I'm, for example, I'm a third year and the main question that is uh, that it, that uh, is into my my mind this year is what I want to do in the future. So I'm 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 curious to hear from uh, maybe Fiona Richardson and Dr. Uh, Jack McDonald 
So do you think that in terms of, um, uh, what do you think uh, in terms of employability, which field do you think will be the most um, looking to, um, to hire students? Which field is that will be in the future uh, looking to, uh, to hire a student in the, in the worst that is a, a, a field, so security, intelligence or whatever? What do you think about this? Maybe if you and I, if you want to start. Okay. So, hello, I'm here, yes. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think it's impossible and dangerous to say this is the one area uh, that is recruiting at the moment. Um, I have actually put in the chat a document which um, I know people find interesting, which is kind of an overview of the main areas that uh, career areas that war studies relates to now having said that loads of war studies students go off and be management consultants and bankers and marketing professionals and all sorts of other things as well so you know you're, you're not restricted here um, in terms of the job market um shall i say a few general things about the graduate job market and then yeah. try yeah, absolutely. be a bit more specific about some of these areas yeah. um, in terms of the job market what we know is um, at the moment graduate vacancies um, are down from last year by about 12 percent now that probably isn't as uh, huge a percentage as you might think you know I think as soon as we're in a economic crisis position everybody thinks there's no graduate jobs there's no graduate jobs Actually, as it stands at the moment, there's only 12% less, less graduate jobs than there were in January pre-pandemic. Um, but what, we, cause what we're seeing is that big graduate recruiters um, learnt from previous recessions that if you cut your graduate recruitment, then when the economy bounces back, oh, what surprise, surprise, you know, your talent pipeline is all messed up and you can't fill positions sort of further down the track. So at the moment, although big recruiters are not um, extending themselves, we're not seeing huge cuts. And big recruiters tend to be the sectors um, that you will see on that uh, chart that I've posted that cover things um, like uh, public sector, um, tech, um, certainly tech consultancy, um, finance, uh, professional services, any, any sort of big recruiter of graduates. Where we are seeing a dip in numbers is in the smaller recruiters. So if you look at smaller recruiters, almost regardless of sector, if you think about sort of charities, NGOs, think tanks, even though they might like very much to keep their talent pipeline in place, they're just not as able to offer those entry level uh, positions at the moment. Um, in terms of which sectors are doing well, um, the one clear winner from this current period is the tech sector. Um, and almost whatever you want to go into, whether you want to go into security, whether you want to go into retail, it's the tech side of that, the cyber security side of that, um, the digital retail, the digital marketing side, which will be recruiting. So that's something to think about almost regardless of which sector you want to go into. Is there kind of a digital tech angle on that that you could chip into? Lots of the sectors that Warsaw's students, students are interested in aren't doing particularly well, but aren't doing particularly badly. Um, so anything where people can work at home, there haven't been mass redundancies yet. Um, it's the sectors like events, like uh, shop retail, like arts and the creative sectors where we've seen lots of, um, you know, increased unemployment. So some quite general comments there um, about, about the graduate labour market more generally. I can get more specific if you want me to, but maybe I'll just say that for now and see, see where that leads us.
All right. Thank you very much. It was uh, very informative, and and um, thank you, thank you very much. Um, so, um, uh, also one of the question um, that we had, and maybe it's more for you again, Fiona and Dr. Jack McDonald. It, uh, we were wondering what kind of uh, skills and um, you know, what kind of uh, skills from uh, the the BA, uh, whether it's uh, uh, IR or war studies or or whatever. Um, can be can be um, highlighted uh, in a resume cover letter, um, not looking at uh, professional experiences, internships, but only uh, to the academic background. What can we put on our resume, uh, and what can we um, write in our cover letter that can can be very attractive for for companies and and um, or public or for the public sector. Jack, do you want to lead on that? And then um, I'll add something in the chat. Okay. Um, in terms of skills developed during your undergraduate degree, um, I'm speaking to the BA here, but this is also relevant to the MA. Um, my first piece of advice is to think about what you do on a war studies degree or international relations or whatever course you're doing, essentially in terms of research communication. That is, Think about the skills you developed in terms of actually being able to research and develop knowledge, um, test critically engage with evidence and theories, but also about the skills you develop in terms of communication. Um, this is because uh, if you are going for things like think tank, NGO jobs, these kinds of things, you are going to be writing primarily for other people, maybe co-workers, your superiors, and therefore the ability to clearly communicate information but also the ability to demonstrate awareness of things like Microsoft Word, PowerPoint, um, these kind of tools that are everyday parts of business is good. Um, another thing uh, I think you should also highlight is any experience you have with say group working or essentially working, uh, producing research in a social fashion. And that's because one of the big jumps between say an undergraduate degree and the workplace is in the workplace you don't really do individual research projects even when you're doing an individual research project you're always doing it in, in almost like constant communication with superiors or co-workers who are always guiding your kind of research output and therefore one of the things to do is to th think reflect on the skills you developed over your course try to highlight perhaps areas that can demonstrate to an employer that you, you know how to work with people, that you are somebody who's able to talk, communicate, but also to re receive feedback and criticism even from peers or from um, say like your module leaders and act upon it and improve on it. Um, and I think like demonstrating the ability to sort of like engage with sort of criticism and kind of iterate and improve your skills is something that employers are looking for. Because obviously when you're applying for entry level roles, you're not expected to be a world expert in anything, but what they are looking for is an appetite and an attitude towards the working world. That means that when they hire you and you get something wrong, which everybody does in any career all the time, uh, they won't have to tell you three or four times to correct it. Um, and I think that that's something to perhaps keep in mind when you're writing your CV. Um, Fiona, uh, do you have, other advice? Yeah, I do. Um, so first of all, I've put in the chat a document that um, I produced with the department uh, about 18 months ago now that looks at the knowledge, attributes, skills and experience that you are likely to leave the department with. So that might give you a few ideas to think about. Um, I was just going to highlight three uh, skills that I know employers are really, you know, it's really high on their agenda at the moment. One of which very much echoes what Jack was saying. Um, and it's the competency, the strength of emotional maturity. Um, and sorry, um, um, and what, um, not emotional maturity, what am I trying to say? Um, Basically, the ability to see what is going on around you and react to it. Uh, so it's that communication piece. It's if you're in front of a client, being able to gauge the situation, gauge what um, 
gauge, uh, you know, what, what is going on, what needs to be said, um, and being able to sort of function quickly and effectively in a professional environment. So that's the number one thing. The number two thing that employers talk about, and this is a word that gets bandied around a lot, is resilience. Um, and I think employers say they really want candidates who have resilience. Graduates always think that they have resilience. Um, and there's kind of a gap between what people sort of see that as meaning. And what employers are really looking for um, is, again, something that Jack said, people who, when things go wrong, um, can pick themselves up, can carry on, can sort of get through the low times and the tough times. And of course, the past year has been an amazing example for you to use of how you have had to be resilient. So something that you can talk about is how you've adapted to lockdown, how you've adapted to having to study in a different way, being isolated from your friends, being able to point out all the positive things that you did, whether it's that you set a study group up with your friends um, or whatever it is that demonstrates your resilience. Um, so at the third one, on, again is a little bit similar it's being able to be agile so whatever job you go into the chances are that in your career you're going to have a few different careers you're going to have a few different jobs a few different diversions and you almost certainly are not going to go in with one set of tech skills and still be using those skills uh, years later Again, what we've really seen in the past year is that the people who have thrived are the people who have been able to really quickly adapt to a completely different way of working. Um, so that ability to learn new things, forget about them, learn a whole new set of ways of working, technology, systems, use those, adapt to something else is something employers are really looking for. Okay, thank you very much. Um, then moving on, maybe I have some questions for um, Tom, Olivia and Robert. Um, so um, first the question, I have one question. So first, maybe Olivia, if you want to, if you want to start, um, why did you choose to, um, to work uh, uh, in this field? Why did you choose to work at uh, Rebellion Defense? And um, yeah. Thanks. Uh, so it's interesting, you know, I've just opened up, Fiona, your overview of the careers in conflict and that practical versus theoretical is basically the struggle that I had my entire way through trying to work out what on earth I wanted to do. And I left my master's and I thought, God, I love this and I want to do a PhD. And then I couldn't think about what I wanted to do my PhD in. And it basically transpired that I couldn't think of something that I could dedicate three years to studying specifically because I was interested in too much stuff. So then I thought, okay, why don't I go and work in a think tank? And then I couldn't find a job in a think tank. Um, you know, it was very difficult to, to find anything when I was applying. I spent a little bit of time sort of out in Latvia in the NATO Strategic Communication Center, which I absolutely loved. But again, you know, it was an underfunded sort of government entity and there were no long-term positions there. So I thought, okay, well, what I want to be able to do is do a lot of academic research, really think about what I'm doing, but also make sure that it has a practical impact. So I did a lot of the comms for a, a prime at one of the, uh, the strategic communication center that I worked at after NATO. And I enjoyed that, but again, it showed me kind of what I didn't want to do. And then I got a call from someone that I used to work with before my master's saying, hey, we've sort of developed this startup it's a bit different it's basically a tech startup which is doing software but not so you can deliver pizzas quickly and not so that you can um you know order a taxi or to drop of a hat it's so that we can build the best possible technology and software for people who put their lives on the line on the front line and i was like okay well you know that sounds interesting and the more people i spoke to and the more i thought about it i was like this is exactly what i want to be doing and my job now is very much like a mixture of policy work and then research around market opportunities and product opportunities so for me it was just a really great balance of both of the things that i enjoy in the sort of defense and national security sector okay um maybe uh robert if you want to 
say what why did you choose to uh, to work in in this field um i guess in short is because they came and asked um to qualify that a bit i kind of i went to my ba i loved doing the war studies topic i did my masters i loved that as well and i was kind of like I was looking for jobs and Talos UK came to King's to do an event and we're like, we're looking for people who are interested in this field. We really value the background knowledge that doing a degree in war studies or uh, can give you. And so I went along and they gave me the job. I, I guess kind of why I still enjoy doing it and why I like doing working in defense and security is that I, I really enjoyed learning about all of these topics. These are kind of global foreign policy, defense, the kind of the way the world works really is what really makes me tick. And although I don't always get to do like everything as sort of academic as I'd like, and I don't get to talk about all things because you know it's a business and you've got to focus on the priorities for that business, I still get to utilize a lot of the background knowledge that I have to then help my stakeholders and sort of my senior leadership make effective decisions because effectively they don't need to tell you about the ramifications and the importance of the work that is working in defense and security. So I guess that will probably be the key thing. It's sort of, it's staying, you develop this sort of passion for the subject and it's just being able to move that into a career that where they value the, the knowledge that you spent a lot of time and a lot of effort trying to cultivate. Okay. And uh, I was wondering, what are your main uh, responsibilities uh... Uh, in your job right now? Uh, so for me, um, effectively, I kind of, I would break it down to three. Um, the first one would be uh, around intelligence. So I'm a business intelligence analyst. So for anyone who, you know, is in, is familiar with the intelligence cycle, I effectively do that, but for uh, business instead of defense. So instead of me, you know, well, I, yeah, I collect intelligence on a daily basis and I feed it to multiple stakeholders across the business to make sure they know what's going on where. Instead of foreign hostile states, it is hostile competitors that we are competing against. It's, you know, it's, it can be quite exciting at times. Um, I also provide support to major prospects. My company supports a lot of stuff that the Ministry of Defence does, everything from Type 31 battleships to the Queen Elizabeth carrier. Um, I provide the kind of analysis and competitor assessments and all of this business lingo that you'll become familiar with if you work in defense, like price to win, value propositions, et cetera, et cetera. Um, then the third thing I do, which is probably my favorite thing, is the strategic thinking and the horizon scanning and thinking about what, where is warfare going, where is defense going, where is security going, and how does a company like mine, who, as sort of echoing what Fiona said around the importance of uh, technology and digital, which is a very digital-based company, where do we play and how do we help, you know, the Ministry of Defence and our other customers maintain their security? Okay, and um, Tom, maybe if you want to say uh, why, um, why did you choose to, um, to work in, uh, in, in this field, so in more uh, crisis management and, and in the Navigate group? And sure. also, what are your main responsibilities? So we can have an overview of uh, what yeah. you're doing. Of course. So my, my role uh, now is, is a few roles on from, from where I started as a graduate. So I think I'll, I'll start there because I think that's probably the, the most important for, for this audience. Um, you know, discussion so far has been what jobs should you apply for and, and how do you get them? Um, and I think that's what everyone uh, wonders. I first started in the private military, private security sector. And half of the battle, I think, for you guys who are entering the job market now is knowing what there is to apply to. Um, and that's either if you want to use your knowledge, i.e. the kind of stuff that you acquire on the course, or if you're comfortable using just the skills that you've acquired on the course, whether that's communication, public speaking, writing, whatever. So I first found out about the security sector through the private military security and research group in my first year at uni. I think that's still running, I'm not sure. Um, but essentially it was a, someone at King's called Ali Hawks who, who kind of got that rolling um, and introduced me to uh, what was then Aegis Defence Services, which was a, a private security uh, company, the largest kind of UK private security company. And how did I get into that? Well, I think most people, certainly when I was at university and then those who I've spoken to afterwards, imagine that 
what they're going to do afterwards is is write Middle Eastern and North African reports. You know, everyone looks for every MENA analyst role that's going everywhere um, because they think that that's what they're qualified to do. And I did exactly the same thing. Applied to many MENA analyst roles uh, and didn't get any. Um, unsurprisingly, and maybe we'll, we'll come on to a little bit about what, why that might be. But I, I got a, uh, a role as a commercial uh, writer for a security company. Basically, I wrote proposals. Um, and to kind of cross over to some of your the discussion that's going on here, um, what I learned very quickly about, about uh, you know, why did I pick this field and, and um, how do you get a job in it? Well, in the security sector, defense sector, uh, if you're doing IR or whatever, you very quickly find that you will be outcompeted for everyone for things like experience in the field, uh, things like, uh, Jack's mentioned, subject matter knowledge. You probably, well, I'm going to say this, you definitely are not going to enter the job market as the most experienced person knowing about the Syrian civil war or whatever it is. So forget that. But what you might be is the best writer. You could legitimately walk into the business on the first day in a, in a defense sector organization and find yourself to be one of the best writers there. Um, so I, I found myself in a commercial position and from there kind of worked through the company. Um, and uh, about two and a half years after I was proposal writing, I then took a promotion to the K&R side of things um, and started doing kidnap for ransom response and crisis response. Um, and then obviously moved on now to do, to do media response. And all of the time, these were jobs, I, I can safely say every single job I've got since graduating, I did not know existed. That's, that's, the, that's the gap between, I think, what, what we're trying to bridge here today and why these events are so important and then what you ultimately go on to do. Um, so yeah, that, that's, that's probably it. What do I do day to day now? Uh, well, I, I kind of explained, I, I run media strategy for crisis incidents. So if a ship catches fire, bumps into something, uh, spills oil everywhere, uh, then it's my job to kind of communicate with the public and others um, about exactly what happened in a way that protects people's uh, reputations moving forward. Uh, with that goes a whole bunch of media training and, and the like. Uh, so that's what I do now, um, kind of out of the hard security sector in something a little bit more uh, opaque and soft. Uh, but, but that's it in a nutshell. Okay, thank you. Um, Olivia, I didn't ask you, but can you uh, give us a, a brief overview of uh, what are your main responsibilities at uh, Rebellion Defense? That would be super interesting. Yeah, of course. So I spend half of my time doing policy work. So with my non-rebellion defence hat on, I do work for the Oxford Trinity Character of War Centre and we run the Secretariat Services for the All-Party Parliamentary Group on Technology and National Security. So I spend a lot of my time convening sort of roundtables and briefings for that and also writing papers. But within the company itself, I also do policy work around, um, you know, evidence submissions for government calls for evidence. Um, and we do that sort of in the UK and the US. And then on the other side of my responsibilities, I do a lot of research and research covers all manner of sins. It's everything from, you know, market intelligence, business intelligence to horizon scanning, as Robert mentioned, um, to, you know, <laughs> competitor research, to, to feeding into sort of founder strategy documents. It can be anything. And I think that's probably what I enjoy is the fact that I have those two sides to my job. And, you know, depending on what day of the week it is, I can be working on something completely new. Okay, so it seems really interesting to see that um, you all need very diverse skills and, and you cover uh, a wide range of uh, different uh, activities. So it's, it, it is really interesting so that we don't have one idea of uh, what, are, what is a job in, in, in the worst that is uh, field. Um, building on this and on this idea of uh, skills and what uh, employer are, are looking at, um, uh, what do you think, um, what are the, what are uh, some uh, vital skills connected to your field? Or what do you think are the main skills needed to work in your field? Maybe, um, um, uh, Olivia, if you want to start and then we'll hand over to Robert and Tom. Sure. So I think, you know, Tom's already mentioned this, but I think being a good writer helps. I think you cover a lot of very broad topics in a war studies undergrad or a master's degree and it sets you up very well for a profession in something like comms or marketing or research and the key thing with all of that is you have to communicate your findings to stakeholders sort of inside and outside of the company so you have to be able to write 
clearly, concisely, and you need to be able to distill very complex ideas. So definitely being a good writer for me is one of them. The other thing I think is a good attention for detail. So not overlooking sort of key things which are gonna be very important and then being able to feed that back into a broader understanding of you know, the context. So for example, being able to read through an article and think, gosh, that's interesting. That reminds me of something I read about all the main operations last week. And, and it's, it's all about building those connections. So I think being able to build connections, you know, a good eye for detail and, and, and writing. Is, is probably, you know, I think those are the key skills for me. Okay, um, Robert, because it, it, it's true that Tom uh, gave, gave uh, his view on, on the skills needed, but maybe Robert, if you want to touch on this. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, 100% agree with Olivia. And to kind of basically parrot what Jack said, it's research communication are the two big skills that I do. I provide analysis on a lot of different stuff and I have to communicate it to stakeholders. I guess in sort of providing a bit of an insight into sort of what I do is that I have a lot of senior sales directors, I have senior leadership who need to go into a briefing with government in three days time to talk about what tellers are doing in this specific area and how we'll help them mod. They don't have time to read like, you know, a five page or a six page musings on the nature of autonomy in the land domain. What they need is a punchy six sentences, which are well thought out with a load of information behind it if they need it. And it is the skills that are sort of, you need to understand all of this sort of capability and understand whatever they've asked you to look at. But the real key thing is the communication of that in a really concise and compelling way. Because quite often, I think one of the most interesting challenges that I come up, come up against in my role is the battle between analysis and gut feel. I work with a load of fairly uh, with sales guys who have worked for a very long time in their professions. They think they know a very uh, country very well, or they know a stakeholder very well, or they've seen a competitor win seven things in a row. So they're going to win that one. My job is to look at it in a very cold way and look at it in a very research way and provide to them the actual, what is more likely to go, you know, there's a really, if you take the intelligence anchoring idea, you know, guy, I've seen guys like sit around bits of information that they're really, really fascinated on and they're sort of, it's their baby, it's their sales pitch. They're never going to not bid, not like no bid this sort of contract. It's your job to provide the evidence and to provide the arguments succinctly and compellingly to really dictate company strategy. And I think those two skills, sort of the research and the communication, are basically would be the two key ones. And then beyond that, I think just, you know, a degree in war studies is so broad and you can do so many different areas. You can study the sort of East Asian politics, you can study different kinds of warfare counterinsurgency, for example. That kind of understanding means. I've been lucky enough to walk into rooms and I'm being told, Rob, we're looking at a bid in uh, Malaysia, for example. I already know the security dynamics in Malaysia from doing a degree in war studies. And you're sort of like that kind of background knowledge, companies will find really valuable because they don't need to teach you it. But I kind of say, I'll pass over to Tom because I think he'll probably have some other insightful comments on it. Yeah, I, I think it's, you know, communication, communication is really important. The other side of that is oral communication. Uh, every job that you're ever going to have to go for, you're basically going to do an interview for. And it's one of the one of the crying kind of criminal aspects of the uh, of the British education system up to this point, that there isn't any kind of compulsory interview training or something like that. The careers office, I know at King's, uh, help out and do a huge amount in terms of prepping for interviews and all that kind of thing. But don't ever let the first time you go for a job, the first interview you have, that's it. It's a live play. You know, that's, that's not where you want to be. Um, build your verbal communication skills. Build your ability to present. Because as Rob says, if he, you know, uh, and Olivia has said as well, if you drop in your six-line report, but then somebody rings you on the phone and says, can you just explain this a little bit more? And you crumble and fall apart. It's not helpful. Um, and ultimately, you know, that's not going to get you to where you want to be. So I think oral communication is definitely, definitely one. Um, one that comes up a lot, you know, I, I've hired war studies grads in the past uh, for roles. And the thing that comes up a lot is if you've got some experience doing, it doesn't even matter necessarily if it's 
for a student run thing, if it's for strife, I know they write a blog, you know, but if you've got some experience doing something, you know, that is really, really important. And I, I emphasize the doing element of it because when you join in an entry level position, you will be doing stuff. Uh, attention to detail, as Olivia says, it is massive because one of the most junior jobs is to proofread documents, but it is one of the most important because I've sat opposite clients where there's a typo in the first paragraph and there's nothing more mortifying. Yeah. So that skill is really, really important early on in your career. As you progress, you will get paid more to do less and think and advise more. But at that entry level, you are doing all of the time. So, so any kind of experience or at least the aptitude and the energy and the attitude um, to go on and do that it is also very helpful. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so um, the, the time is running, so maybe we can move on to the, the second topic of the discussion. So navigating through the job market uh, during COVID-19 and, uh, and this, um, this crisis and building on what, uh, what uh, Tom, you said about, uh, and, and uh, Olivia and, and, and Robert also uh, about communication. So I had one question. So maybe Fiona, um, if you want to start is, um, is there anything a student can do to work on, on those skills? So whether communication or writing uh, uh, during, uh, during lockdown? So um, where can students can find resources to, to work on those skills? And yeah, if you have any idea on that, that would be very helpful. Yeah, sure. A few ideas of what students can be doing sort of right now. Um, my, my laptop is telling me my connection is unstable, so I hope I hang in here. Um, there aren't as many actual internships as there usually are, but one thing that there's a real growth in is virtual internships. Uh, so one thing you can do is look at the virtual internship market. Um, there's a website called Forage where anyone can sign up and take part in a virtual internship and basically you're almost set like a project piece of work and um, given um, it's more like an experience of work rather than your your than an internship but that can be a good starting point for people um, really echo what Tom said doing okay so any kind of way that you can get out of your house or out of your student accommodation um, and volunteer at the moment, I think speaks volumes. Uh, I signed up the other week to be a vaccine volunteer. It was really easy to do. I'm doing a shift a week to um, escape my family for half a day. Um, there really are opportunities out there. I think when you're applying for jobs, at the moment, employers recognise that you won't have been doing all the internships, but what, what you can say you can have been doing instead is really important. Something I mentioned and Tom mentioned, if you can uh, write, so writing for Strife, but actually even looking at your own social media profile and how you use that. So, you know, you could you turn your Twitter feed into something that you really use to comment on um, industry things um, that interest you. So that when an employer Googles you, what they see is a sort of portfolio of you being interested um, and participating um, in the debate. Few things that are going on at King's, the King's Undergraduate Research Fellowships, the Curf is about to be advertised in the next few weeks. So if you're an undergrad, that's an opportunity to, um, to take part in research, paid research this summer. A uh, couple of other things, we have um, internship programmes which um, have currently have paid internship vacancies. Um, they are open to students from underrepresented. Definitely, you're the first in your family to go to university. It could be that you're from an ethnic minority. And we also have an internship program called Aspire, which is for students with disabilities. And we have live internships 
paid internships that you can apply for there. So that's just a few quick ideas of things that you can get involved in right now. Yeah, and speaking of uh, Strife, I think I've seen that they're looking for some people to uh, feel, uh, feel in uh, some positions. I think it's for uh, undergraduate or I think I, I can find the, the, the link and put it in the chat uh, later when, when I, I'll have uh, time. Um, so thank you very much, uh, Fiona, for, for your answer. Um, maybe, uh, Jack, if you have something to add, I don't know, uh, about uh, what skills can we uh, work on during lockdown and... Um, uh, um, I don't have much to add okay. beyond Fiona's. I do think that um, it, like, a Twitter and things like that are good networking uh, tools. Like you, particularly if you start to follow people in the industry, you will just see jobs like floating up that you may not have actually like seen. You'll also uh, tend to see transient opportunities. Sometimes people have like uh, temporary funding, things like research assistants that they occasionally post that might not even go through formal recruitment processes. Um, the, you know, I do think um, I am in the position where I can be uh, informal on my so on my public facing social media uh, to a certain extent, um, but it, like it's completely different to the situation about ten years ago. Because ten years ago, me and my friends who were using social media could have jokes, and our boss wasn't on there. Um, and more importantly, when we we're going for jobs, um, the the recruiters weren't checking to see our public facing profiles. So. I realize that like it's a maybe a hard switch, but do consider, um, you know, orientate like having a public facing social media profile and keeping like good times with your friends on private. Um, in terms of like what you can do, uh, writing is good. Um, the, you know, 10 years ago, it used to be blogging. Um, blogging has pretty much died a death in terms of like the the info sphere almost. Um, but you know, if you are interested in a subject, you want to t demonstrate knowledge of a subject, keeping a small blog on the subject, uh, and like tweeting about it, even if you're not getting reposts and stuff like that, you know, stuff that perhaps strife won't post or, or you know, because strife only has a certain amount they can push out, uh, like any other kind of like media outlet. Um, you may think you may think of something like a blog is a great place to actually practice your own writing. Um, like I learned a lot in my early career from blogging informally, just about like fleeting thoughts about defense policy, and it definitely helped my writing when I was actually going into the academic profession. Um, but that that would be my advice. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, we have one question for uh, Martin. Uh, he's asking if uh, you have any recommendation when looking for senior, uh, semi-senior positions. Um, Jack or Fiona, if you, any one of you. Want to so, so advice about looking for semi-senior positions. Yeah. I mean, I guess I would say make an appointment and we can talk specifically about um, his situation. Um, but generally, when I'm talking to students who are doing their degree, uh, be it an undergrad or a master's, and they've got a career behind them, I think the networking piece is more important than ever. Because probably you're not going to go in through the kind of straight graduate um, filter if that even was a thing in the sector you're interested in. But probably you're going to get an opportunity because someone is going to think, oh, it's quite interesting how their experience in this matches with their academia and what we're doing. So I would say that looking for those more experienced positions, networking is more important than ever. All right, thanks a lot. Um, now I have a question for um, Olivia, Robert, and Tom. Um, so I was wondering how was your, your work impacted by uh, COVID-19 and how did you cope with this? And 
um, maybe if you have some tips uh, for students uh, dealing with, I don't know, um, um, mental health and how, how we talked about resilience. So how did you, uh, um, how did you work on your uh, resilience uh, skills, uh, I wanted to say? Um, maybe Olivia, if you want to start or... Sure. So on the how did my job change? Well, I actually started this job mid lockdown. So, um, you know, it was interesting getting to know an entire team basically virtually. I mean, luckily I knew a couple from before, but it was still very much about finding out about a new company through a screen as opposed to in person. And it was tough, but also I think there were some advantages. Um, you know, it was very easy. We're a UK US company, so it was a really great way for me to just reach out for, you know, a virtual coffee or whatever with my counterparts over the pond. And had we not been in lockdown, you know, they probably would have had less time to do that. So actually, from a UK US perspective, it's been quite helpful. From a UK perspective, it's a very small team. There are only, well, there are now about 10 people in the UK office and I joined there about five. So it was okay to get a sense of community, but I, I, you know, I imagine it's been very difficult for people who've joined bigger companies and they've had to do everything online. Um, that said, everything is now online. So you can attend conferences, events, and a whole number of other things that, you know, you previously wouldn't have been able to because you would have had to go from venue to venue. And actually, as a learning experience, having had those big conferences and events going online has been sort of brilliant. And I know that, you know, tomorrow there's a Defence IQ event, which has sort of Tom Coppinger Sims and various other people from Strategic Demand talking. You have the Defence One conferences. And so actually, you know, yes, it's been difficult, but there are opportunities as well. So I think in terms of resilience, it's about making the most of a bad situation and realizing that there are new opportunities that have come up because of COVID. And I think the other, you know, from, a, from an individual perspective as well, it's very important to take time away from your screen. And this, you know, that sounds like a moot point, but you know, simply building time into your schedule, being selfish with your calendar and blocking out time for your morning walk or your run or whatever it is, make sure that you get outside is, is invaluable. Okay, thank you very much. It, it, it pretty much answered the, the, the second question about how to avoid uh, performance pressure and still work on the, on, on the before mental, mental skills uh, in, this, uh, in this time. Um, maybe Tom or Robert, if you want to um, talk about how your work uh, changed and how you, 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 you um, changed your, your habits and, and how your skills, uh, how, how uh, the, your skills development was uh, impacted. Sure, yeah. Um, I mean, I, my work's changed a lot, uh, changed a lot because of COVID. Um, and that's primarily because I do a lot of travel. Um, ordinarily, before this, I'd probably spend a week, a month out of the UK doing uh, media training or something like that. Um, and obviously all of that ceased. Uh, that ceased to exist uh, for the last sort of year or so. Um, what does that mean? It means that we've taken most of our media training, well, all of our media training online. So we're still delivering that, but we're delivering it online. Um, and that's probably as well, you know, indicative of some of the stuff and some of the functions that ordinarily uh, in other businesses, and you'll be going into a new work environment now, guys, because uh, some of these things won't change back. You know, I will have clients who uh, always took face-to-face -face training, uh, but they won't take it ever again now because they've seen that an online option works. So things have fundamentally changed in the workplace and, uh, and, and I think we'll continue to do so. Um, it's had some benefits. Benefits are, uh, you know, save a certain amount of money uh, in a practical way. You have a certain amount more time to yourself in a practical way if you're not uh, wasting on other things. Uh, damaging things, I think, and this is particularly true of new starters. When I began my career, the most valuable things that I learned uh, were not the tasks that were given to me. In the first year of what I was doing, it was about learning how an office works, learning the fundamentals of office dynamics, speaking a little bit in the kind of the corridor and the tea room and blah, and picking up and accumulating knowledge. That now is a process that doesn't happen organically. That's something you need to kind of make happen. So I think anyone entering the workplace now really like you know listen to what olivia said if you can carve out five minutes to, to have coffee with colleagues to speak a little bit about that that's great 
Um, mental health wise, uh, I, I think part of it is is just accepting that people aren't in the best uh, best frame of mind and best places a lot of the time now. Um, you know, I, I started in the best vein of form. I think like most people downloading Mike Run and Strava and stuff. The last run I went for was in April, yeah, last year. Like I, but I just, just gave myself a break and just said, well, that's, that's sort of fine. I think redefining a little bit about what you want to achieve, being really focused about what you want to achieve in a certain time frame, um, uh, helps. Uh, but yeah, try and rely on, uh, try and rely on obviously, uh, speaking a lot, a lot more to colleagues, you know, do voice, you know, your concerns for other people. Uh, I'll pass over to Rob. He's probably got more, more than that. Thanks Tom. Um, I think. COVID impacted defence primed, especially in quite a big way, given that a lot of us sit in aerospace as well. And suddenly you see your entire civil market pretty much drop to zero. Like Talos, every plane that Airbus flies has, you know, equipment from Talos. And so that was an interesting experience, just sort of seeing how, as a business, you have to realign and think about what your priorities are. And me working within strategy, I'm a key part of that. In terms of the personal stance like as a lot of new starters and i live in london i you know the, the accommodation was secondary and it was all about the location and going to the job and therefore when a, a lockdown happens and you're stuck in a, basically a three room box with no balcony and no garden you're suddenly like ooh. now it's a it was an interesting change um i think to echo what both tom and olivia have said structure was key you know i used to be on a train to work by 6 30 because that's how just my body works i do early morning stuff you know that didn't happen anymore because i wasn't commuting anywhere you know i used to fly around you know or train around the country going to reading going to crawley you know glasgow belfast sort of existing sites the only time i've left my house to do anything for work was when i got a lucky you know i jumped the chance to go down to the qec down in portsmouth and then I jump on an aircraft carrier just because I want to get out of the house. Um, but I think structure is key. And like my, I've got good line managers. I've got good senior stakeholders who understand that like, if you've put on your communicator that you're out for a walk, you're out for a walk. You know, I get told off when I answer the phone when I'm on the break. Um, and it's very, it can be very difficult, especially as young professionals where, you know, you have less space, you have smaller housing to you. It's, it's really maintaining the distance between work and non-working. Like I used to be able to get on the train home and switch off. I'm not thinking about work anymore. And now, you know, you creep into the habit of leaving your laptop on until six o'clock, seven o'clock, eight o'clock. And it's resisting that urge to let work take over everything. Or if you are going to do that, think about developing yourself at the same time through work. So taking up our Olivia's point around conferences, because they're all online now, I can go to a couple of Asia House briefings, I can go to Rusi briefings, I can go all of this, all of these different things from just the comfort of my, you know, very small bedroom. And that allows me to develop my own knowledge. And I guess being, all of us being trapped in our own rooms gives us an ability to think about where do we want our careers to go? And what are the key things about, I guess, to put it in our personal brand say that we want to put forward and i think but underlining that is the idea that it is to do it at your own pace there were times this year i'm sure everyone on the call can echo that where i just didn't want to do anything you know my for example like my family's from like tier london uh, uh, london is a tier four was tier four over christmas so getting the news that you wouldn't be able to go home and see your family over Christmas was a really tough blow for someone. And obviously I wasn't very productive that week, but that's okay. So I think it is, it's the idea around being aware of your, of how resilient you are. And also the idea of communicating with your colleagues and that you are a team first and foremost, especially for my example, there are a team of nine or 10 analysts and all of them are gonna have a terrible week once or twice during a global pandemic, whether it's I've now got to, you know, homeschool my kids to, you know, um, my, one of my loved ones is sadly ill. So it's, it's a combination of, as we, we, we sort of spoke out at the beginning of the talk, the sort of the emotional intelligence, but also the emotional intelligence of understanding ourselves and sort of 
giving ourselves a break, I guess, every now and again. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, I think it's really interesting to hear from you about uh, resilience and mental health. I think it's very important in those uh, difficult times. Um, uh, um, uh, wait, sorry, Caroline sending me a question. Um, um, maybe, so I have one last question because it's already six. Um, so it's a little bit going uh, going before and and looking at um, uh, choosing a, a job because I I wrote down a question and I forgot to ask you and I think it, it is very uh, interesting and I'm curious to hear about uh, what you you have to say. So what what would you um, what would you uh, wish you had known before starting your job search? I think it's uh, the question I'm uh, the most uh, curious uh, to hear from you. Yeah, I wish someone had told me it's going to be bloody hard. You know, there's going to be a lot of disappointment and you've got to kiss a lot of frogs to find something that's right. But I think the key thing is not to go in with like a set perception about what it is that you want to do. Like all experience is good experience. Even if you absolutely hate a job, it's invaluable because it teaches you to be resilient and it also teaches you what you do not want to be doing in future. So yeah, no experience is a bad experience. Do everything that comes your way. Say yes, even if it feels weird. Like I got rejected from a job two days before I got the job in Riga and I literally had to pack up my life and turn around to Riga in two days. And you know what? It's probably the best decision I've ever made. And I think just that willingness to be flexible, to kind of, you know, bend with the storms rather than snap under them is is important and someone will tell you you know it will be okay in the end you will find the right thing for you it might take some time you know you're gonna have to you'll have a few setbacks along the way but but you will get there in the end um robert or tom um i guess sort of is is echoing the Olivia's point around there is no fixed destination when having a career from war studies. I guess I went, I went into a war studies degree with all of my friends and family just assuming I was joining the army to um, then leaving. And I hadn't heard of Tales or half the defence companies that I work with on a regular basis, even during my you know BA. And the key point is, is that the, there are multiple careers within war studies and you will have multiple careers throughout your professional time. And there is sort of, it's taking little bits from each of those and working towards sort of, you can have a set destination in mind if there's something you really want to do. If you say you want to be, you know, you can be the defense minister of the United Kingdom, if that is your goal, great. Most people don't have that. And we have the luxury of working in industry that is, generally pretty interesting across the board you know I, I had to think before i came on this call about where a load of my friends that i used to sit with in seminars are having left war studies i've got police i have private intelligence agencies i have actual government intelligence agencies that some of them don't even do anything to do with war studies and just use really really good analytical skills and all of those are perfectly good uses of a war studies degree because even if you don't use if you, if you use, even if you barely use any of the background knowledge you've sort of picked up from doing a degree in war studies, you'll still have really excellent conversations at the pub. So it's the understanding that the path falls out ahead of you. You just have to be very active and proactive, especially in sort of looking for the opportunities and taking them when they come. Okay, thank you very yeah. much. Yep, yeah. sorry. Yeah, I'll I'll yeah, of course. Yeah, I'll quickly. Uh, very little to add to all both excellently articulated um, points. Um, but two things for me. One is um, understand why you know, uh, as Olivia says, be open to all of all of the opportunities that come your way, and don't pigeonhole yourself. But also understand why you're being hired by an organisation. You're being hired as a graduate, not to be an expert. You're being hired to tell them why they're doing things wrong to be disruptive, to ask questions about how they improve things, to move things in a direction um, from that, that sense. Do not underestimate your value just because you're the lowest paid person in the room. That's not why you're there. You're there in order to try and challenge the 
conventional ways of thinking. That was good advice that was given to me and I wish I'd known uh, beforehand. Uh, the second thing to say, I think, would just be to uh, think really, really carefully about the, the private sector versus the public sector and the different competencies and the different career paths that they're going to take you on. Uh, it's not necessarily about picking one right now, uh, but it is understanding that if you want to go and work for a three letter agency or you want to go and work for civil service, there is a process to that. That is not something that if you think, right, I'm graduating, I'm going to join a diplomatic service. Where's the, where's the one month recruitment timeline? That ain't how it happens. You know, that is year long, sometimes five year long career path so you can get into that field. So really understand just a little bit about what you're getting into in terms of that split. Uh, but that, that's it from me. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I think Fiona had to leave. I don't know if she's still here. Uh, she had to leave at six, but she said something I think um, uh, useful. So she said um, that she would recommend um, LinkedIn learning. Learning. Oh, yeah, she she she's here. Yeah. yeah, I'm just. Yeah, that was just to add to things that you can do during lockdown. Um, LinkedIn learning, which you can access through your King's account, has got amazing stuff on it. Um, I don't have anything to add. Um, I just wanted to flag up the department is having a uh, alumni careers evening on the 2nd of March. Um, so probably a little bit similar to tonight, uh, but with different speakers, different sectors. So if you've enjoyed tonight, that will be helpful to you too. Thanks very much for inviting me to take part, Fanny. Bye bye. Thank you very much for participating. Thanks. Um, well, I think for me, I, I asked um, all the questions that I had, but I'm, I'm curious to uh, hear the questions that maybe uh, uh, you guys have. So if you want to write down any questions you have on the group chat so that um, uh, Olivia, Robert, Tom and Jack can answer. Um, I don't know if you have any questions. Um, I was I was um, I was wondering if uh, uh, due to the the, the current crisis, um, I don't know if many career related activities are because um, many career uh, career activities are taking place online, and I'm not sure if employers uh, are going to adapt uh, accordingly and adapt their expectations. But I don't know if anyone can really answer this question they've got to otherwise they will uh, lose access to yeah. much needed recruitment i think you know i was on a i was on a call with as olivia said i was on a call with mitch Gopinger signs on a call with him yesterday and he was talking about uh, defense digital because uh, that's the big thing for defense now if anyone wants to learn about anything to get uh, an interest from the defense industry is about digital applications um was that it's key that the defense and security sector invest in young talent otherwise you know it becomes a very old dog industry so i would say it would be in their interest to be looking for people with fresh ideas and an understanding of where you know the future of security and defense is going because it is going places fast i think it's the fifth revolution i believe is well that's sustainability that's the other one digital sustainability the two things i think you should be looking at if you're looking for tidbits from the defense industry all right thanks thanks a lot um so maybe if you don't have any questions um we can uh wrap up and if you uh if the panelists want to uh, maybe give uh, their um their best tip uh, for for the future for job hunting or for i don't know like mental health resilience uh, during uh, during the crisis and and for uh, during uh, their their work time um, yeah, if you want to just uh, give the, the last advice that you have for all the students here, that would be great. Um, I guess my advice, uh, echoing what Tom said, is that uh, getting your first job is more of a marathon than a sprint. Um, so don't take rejections to heart. Um, don't set your sights on one job. Um, be flexible if you can be. You know, keep your eyes open for jobs that uh, have openings abroad, uh, uh, international organisations and things like that. Um, and lastly, just before uh, I go, uh, something uh, about LinkedIn learning that we have at King's. Uh, 
you can also look at that for things like project management and uh, other kinds of like management level uh, courses. They have them there. And that's maybe useful for you to understand where you fit within an organization because that's the kind of things that your managers are going to be doing. Um, so, you know, understanding things like project management is perhaps something, a good kind of like thing to learn about. Um, yeah. Anyway, that's it for me. I'm afraid I've got to run and take care of my kid. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jack, for uh, participating and for taking time uh, to uh, discuss with, it, with, with us. Um, yeah, maybe uh, if uh, Olivia or Tom, you want to give a, a last, uh, last advice, last tip. Uh, I think two last tips for me. Firstly, is do it all with a smile. You know, it's going to get tough. It is a marathon, not a sprint. But if you can keep your sense of humour in all of this, then it doesn't. It's not so bad. Uh, and then secondly, is that you know, there are so many super super talented people at Kings. Don't do yourself down in interviews. You know, we all have this sort of modesty complex where actually when it comes to really selling what we're good at and our achievements a lot of us tend to downplay them and don't be afraid of telling people why you're brilliant and what you've done because ultimately you know you've got to sell yourselves in these jobs they're super competitive and just don't do yourself a disservice tell the truth and sell yourself yeah i mean i think that's i think that's fab advice i mean i think my, my top tip would, would be to reiterate something that olivia said earlier which is apply for everything you know just think about you know we haven't even mentioned some of the industries where that have the quote unquote sexiest jobs you know there will be people who think what i'd really love to do is go and be a, an afghan intelligence analyst but you know what you know luckily enough i've been to afghanistan but you know who goes there a lot insurance people that's who goes there a lot brokers insurance reps people who go out there and have a look around and we've not even talked about that and that is one of the biggest industries in the uk so do not just think, oh, I really want to write about, I don't even know what the, the current issue is that people are writing about in the, in the sense of everyone wanting to do it. When I was at uni, it was Syrian civil war. You know, don't just be like, that's really what I want to do for a living. That's fantastic. Yeah, really just like think broadly about how you're going to use your skills. Uh, that'd be, yeah, it's, it's Olivia's tip really, but that's, that's the, the key takeaway for me. Great, thanks a lot. And uh, I was thinking about skills and we, we talked about LinkedIn, but also you can find on Keats uh, lots of uh, different um, skills learning uh, about, for example, Excel. Uh, I'm really super bad at this, so it was very uh, useful to find uh, some tips. I can't remember uh, the, the link on Keats, but if you na navigate through, uh, through Keats, you can find lots of uh, different resources uh, that can help you uh, uh, enhance uh, uh, your your uh, software skills. Um, I think uh, if there is no more questions, um, we can uh, end up here. And uh, I really want to thank you, uh, thank you guys, uh, for participating and taking time for us. Uh, it was really interesting, and I really uh, I really enjoyed it. Um, so thank you very much, and uh, have a, a great evening. And um, uh, I hope to uh, to see you uh, maybe uh, in another event or or uh, career related to worst it is or um, or so, some something else. So thank you, uh, thank you very much. Cheers, thank you, thanks for all no, guys. Awesome, Bye. this has been great. Thanks, Lenny. Yeah. Bye, everyone. Bye. Cheers. Bye.